The rishis in the Rig Veda is the same as the rishis in the list of the Brihadaranya. Not one of them. Moreover, in the Rig Veda, we do not find the traditional teaching that we find in the Upanishad. I am Atma Brahma, or Aham Brahmasmi. We do not find it in the Rig Veda. We found it formulated differently in some of the hymns, but we do not find this particular Upanishadic formulation. So how come if they coincide, if the Rig Veda is 1200 and the tradition of the Upanishad, let's say, begins at around that date, why is it not found? Why is there no coincidence between them? But there is. But you find the Upanishad is teaching in the Atharva Veda. Atharva Veda, some hymns begin to talk about the Atma Brahma doctrine. So, the um, Rig Veda must be a lot, lot older than the Brihadaranyaka if 60 teachers cannot be found one of them in the Rig Veda. Next one, please. We come to Paleo Astronomy as further evidence. In 1969, Raghavan calculated that many astronomical references in Mahabharata converged in the year 3067. This was confirmed with computer and planetarium by astrophysicist Narahari Acha first time in 203. I think, in fact, it was Dr. Kalyana Raman who asked him to do that. Isn't that so? That's right. He asked him, just try it and see what you find. And he did, and he found the same year, 3067. Now, true enough, there are some doubts. Iyenga, another physicist, another great scientist down in Bangalore, has slightly different views, questions this date. But for the moment, there isn't really any significant reason to doubt Acha. So if Mahabharata begins at around about 3,000, then how much older must be the Rig Veda, whose language is significantly older, very, very different? Next one. And we come now to River Saraswati. Saraswati is mentioned in all the books of the Rig Veda as a great river nourishing the five tribes of the Aryans, the Anus, the Turvasas, the Druhyus, the Purus and the Yarus. And it's called in book two Naditama, huh? Ambitama, Devitama. Greatest river, best mother, best goddess. In book in Mandala 6, in 52, it is said that Saraswati is swollen, is made large, Pindvamana, Sindhubhi, by many rivers. Because lots of rivers were coming down from the Himalayas, falling into the Saraswati, and the Saraswati was flowing all the way down to the sea, an enormous river. It is calculated that at one or two places, one place, it, its width was 14 kilometers. Can you imagine that? And 795 says it flows clear, Giribhya a Samudra, from the mountains to the ocean. Here, Samudra cannot possibly mean confluence or terminal lake or a gathering place of water in the Himalayas. 796 too, it is said that the Purus inhabit its two bushy banks. 
And then in the tenth mandala, still it is called a great river nourishing the tribe. And there is a him praying to Saraswati to continue to sustain the good fortune of the Vedic tribes. How old is Saraswati? Now, uh, Michel Danino, an archaeologist, a French archaeologist who lives in India and in fact has become an Indian uh, subject now, he's an Indian uh, civilian, uh, has written recently, uh, last year, a, a splendid book gathering up all the evidence about Saraswati up until now. It's called The Lost River. I have no royalties, I'm not pushing it. But it's an excellent book. Now, can we have the next one, please? Therein, you will find that uh, in the very latest research, Pura Tattva, uh, Sharma and other scientists, uh, show that Saraswati flows down to the sea. Now, these scholars say that this happened before 3,600. I should have added there uh, Bridget Olchin. She's another British archaeologist and expert on the uh, Harappan civilization. That's the only time, 3,600, that the river could have flowed down to the sea. After that time, it begins to dry up and it becomes completely dried up in 1900. So, if the Rig Veda is praising Saraswati as a great river swollen by many other rivers flowing down to the ocean, it must, these, at least these hymns, must have been composed before 3600. Wouldn't you say? Say yes, yes. Come on. It's not difficult. Now, the name Saraswati, Saras means she who has swirls, ponds, currents. Now, the Dhatu Sri is given in the Dhatu Pata is Dhatau, flowing, lifting, rushing. Now, you find the same Dhatu is cognate in Latin as sal, in Greek as hial or hal, and in Tokaria, another in the European language, as sal, leaf. Now, the datu sr gives lots of, it gives the, the verb sisarti or sarate, and also sara, sara, sarayu, sarayu, sarit, sara, and so on. Now, Mainstream Indo-European scholars say, claim, that the Aryans came into Saptasindu, saw this beautiful river, and gave it the name Saraswati in memory of Harakhwaiti, which was in Iran. Now, the twisted thinking here is beyond belief. Observe this. The word Harak stands alone in Avesta. There is no other word related to that word. The word for lake, the corresponding of Saras, is Vairi. Do I give it there? Yes, Vairi. Harak, nobody knows what it means. There is nothing in Avesta to suggest anything about Harak. We say Harak Vaiti means perhaps a river with lakes or a river with swirls and so on, because we take it from Sanskrit. Now, how is it possible? Follow my thinking, please. You have Avesta with Harak Vaiti. Now, the word Harak has no Dhatu, has no other relatives in the language. You come to Sapta Sindhu, suddenly Saras has a Dhatu, has many relatives. Not only that, but it connects with other Indo-European languages. Now, how were the Indo-Aryans capable of inventing all this stuff? 
where they were. What happened is the opposite. The Iranians moved out of Sarasvati, out of Sarkasindu, into Iran and took the memory of Sarasvati with them, but lost the rest of it. Do you follow? Good. There is another aspect. Observe this. Iranian does not have the original Indo-European sa sound. It has in its place a. Soma, in the, the drink that the gods and the Vedic people drank, becomes in a Western Hauma. Asura becomes Ahura, Ha. You follow? So, the Indo-Aryans move away from Iran, they come into Sapta Sindhu, they retain the original Sa sound, but mysteriously the Western people lose the Sa and they make it into Ha. Now, how is this possible? The further you travel along, the more losses you are going to have. And the more steadfast you remain in one place, the greater the chances that you will preserve the heritage. If you are moving, you don't have time to teach the children properly. If you, are, if you stay put, then you've got time to teach the children properly and continue the tradition. Next one, please. Now, it, it, this, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to be very technical linguistically here. Please forgive me. If you don't understand, it doesn't matter. What I'm trying to prove is that Vedic is much older than Avesta. You see, in Avesta, the A, the original Indo-European A, becomes uh, uh, E-O. Now, Vedic has Naram. Avestan has not um. Do you follow? The original S, as I said, became Ha. The voice aspirates like Da become Da in Avestan. So the verb Da, Da, Dhati, Dhana, and so on, becomes in Avestan Da. And therefore it becomes indistinguishable from the verb Da, which means I give. Da means I place. Da I give, but in a Western both are Da. But the most significant part of the Lord is that periphrastic perfect. Now, shall I go on with periphrastic perfect? Do you know, have any idea what periphrastic perfect is? Please, there are some linguists down there. <laughs> now, in very Periphrastic perfect, we use it all the time in English. I have done. Have and done is periphrastic perfect. You use an auxiliary verb to indicate past tense. I did is an aorist. It's past, but it has no auxiliary. I have done has an auxiliary, and therefore it's called periphrastic. Okay? Yes. Now, in Vedic, you have a uh, the accusative feminine, gamayam, chakara, or chakre. Then in the Brahmanas, you had as and bu. So you have a new periphrastic pattern. A new verb was used as an auxiliary. What happens in Avesta? Avesta has a periphrastic perfect with the feminine, again, accusative, but with the verb to be, ah, exactly as the Brahman has, ash. What does this suggest? Now, to any trained linguist or historian who got his wits about him, this suggests that the Iranians split from the Indo-Aryans 
when us began to be used. They forgot about tree and they used us. If if the indo aryans had left Iran, then the first periphrastic perfect, the auxiliary verb in the periphrastic perfect, the first one would have been us. Gamayam asa, not Gamayam chakre. And then they would have developed the periphrastic perfect with the auxiliary kri. Okay? You follow? Good. Well, I won't go any further. Next one, please. I will sum up the isoglosses because, again, this is highly technical and I know you are, most of you are scientists <coughs> and don't really know much about linguistics and I don't blame you. I don't want to know much about linguistics either. But, according to the... Uh, AIT, beginning from the Kurgan, people spread out and they carried the language and the language got developed differently. But you, fa you have isoglosses that are shared between Tocharian, Italic, and Celtic. This is the so called the Ra marker for the medial passive perfect, forgive me. Even I don't know what it means. <laughs> now, how is it possible, observe, that Tocharian, which is far east, and Celtic, which is far west, retain the same isogloss, but Sakta Sindhu, Indic, Sanskrit, did not retain it. Iranian did not retain it. How, how is this possible? It's not possible. This means that Tocharian, Germanic, Slavic, Albanian, Greek were together, they developed this isogloss to the exclusion of uh, Iranian and Indian. But where would they have been together to the exclusion of Sanskrit? If you move from the Kurgan down, you come into the Black Sea and drown. So they couldn't possibly go south. If they went up north, that means that Hittite would have to double back and come into Anatolia. Also, Greek would have to double back. If they went Eastward, they would fall into the Caspian Sea, or if they didn't fall into the Caspian Sea, that meant that the Germans and the Italians moved westward, they doubled back again. If they moved to the west, that, meant, that means that the Tocharian and the Armenians moved eastward. So it doesn't really make much sense. This applies to a lot more isoglosses. But if you start from Bactria, you, the Tocharians move up and so you dismiss them and that's that. You don't have to bother with them again. Then the others move further on and that's okay. And Vedic did not preserve this. It did actually in a small measure but there is no problem. So even isoglosses, a perfectly linguistic matter goes against the linguists who propose the Aryan invasion theory. I have written a very long paper, it will get published very shortly, and if you scientists are interested, I'll send you a copy so you can read it, showing it in very great detail. Next one, please. Now, this is... Uh, 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 a scholar in New York. Now, please read what he writes. Uh, after he saw my papers, he wrote to me, and we are good friends and correspondent now. This quite independently of me, I didn't know him when he was writing these things. 
Hirokumi after Watson, that's how we got to know one another. Well, in David, uh, as you see, I, I myself made a study of uh, Mesopotamian religion and compared it to the Vedic religion. Um, and in fact, the Adya Library has published this as a monograph. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't come to bring it here so you can buy it. I, again, I don't have any royalties, but it would help. Uh, it would help them. Um, and I show that, in fact, uh, Vedic is, in fact, much, much older than the Mesopotamian religion. So again we arrive, the Mesopotamians begin to rise into history around about 3000. Next one please, mathematics. Now this will please you all. In fact it would be very nice if some of you actually looked at the Shulba Sutras and see if you agree with Seidenberg. Seidenberg was He's dead now. He was a great American mathematician and a historian of science, and he published two articles, one in 1962 and one in 1979, which we'll see. Is it in 1978, which we shall see. Now we come to something that nobody can argue against, DNA. Genetics. Uh, anthropological studies Actually, Kazanas, at where he mentions me, Kazanas cites an anthropologist, uh, Gregory Kennedy, from the United States. Uh, he's done the study, and he claims that there can't have been any change in the features of the Harappan people uh, after, after 4,500. There is none, no change. But genetic studies are, in fact, much more firm and they tell us that there was no significant flow of genes into India between 10,000 BCE and 600 BCE. 600 BCE, in the 6th century, the Persians began to come down and they conquered parts of ancient India. So, yes, from that period onward, they can trace the influx of foreign genes, but not between 600 and 10,000. On the contrary, uh, Oppenheimer, in 2003, claims that round about 50 or 40,000 years, People having moved out of Africa into Central Asia, they began to move, perhaps, he says, from Kashmir and Sattasindu into the Northwest and Europe. So the flow is the other way around, according to all these geneticists. Observe what particularly uh, Stephen Oppenheimer, who is an Oxford uh, geneticist, said, any theory of a male invasion of India is undermined by the data. You cannot have a theory of invasion or immigration into India from Northwest because the data do not support it. From 2003 onwards, these data are solid, they have not been disproved, and later studies like Sahu 2006 in the Scientific American, or is it the, the Genetic uh, Journal of the United States, show this. Next one, please. Well, here you have Leach, Edmund Leach, the provost of uh, King's College. He puts his finger right on the soft spot. Indo-European scholars should have scrapped 
all their historical reconstructions and started again from scratch. But this is not what happened. Vested interests and academic posts were involved. He said that, saying that once archaeologists unearth the Harappan culture, the thinking of linguists should have changed, but it didn't. Because you have now a tremendous paradox. You have an enormous, solid culture, the Harappan civilization, Indus Saraswati civilization, from 3000 to 1900, but it has no literature. Then, in the same place, shortly afterwards, you have, according to the mainstream theory, an enormous literature, the Vedic literature, which has no solid civilization to support it. It's an enormous parable that no historian can swallow. Let's go further down. Next one, please. What have we got here? We now examine the literary evidence in the Rig Veda itself. The Angirases say, our ancestors have always been here, they've sacrificed here. We don't remember any other place. The Vasishtas say the same thing in Book 7. In Book 5, we have uh, Asmaka Sashcha, Surayu, Vishwa Asas, Tarishani. Tarishani should be, is it? Oh. Yes, it is. It is correct there. It's, it's wrong here. Um, and it explains, let our sages pervade all regions. They begin to have, they begin to show, there are only uh, little snippets, that they were aware of their own civilization, they were aware of their own high level of culture, and they thought that their sages should go to other regions and civilize those people. Because around about 8,000, around about 10,000, the glaciers all over Europe and Asia began to melt. And you have about two or 3,000 years of very heavy rains. But around about uh, the eighth millennium, it was possible to start traveling. You didn't have floods, you didn't have heavy rains, and you certainly didn't have glaciers anymore. And uh, in Mandala 7, spread far over the earth, it is said. Mandala 10, spread far the Aryan laws. In 661.9, which is a hymn to Saraswati, it is said, Sano Vishwa Adi Vishwa Sastri Anyar Gavari Adam Aheva Surya. What does this mean? She, the goddess Saraswati, made us all, that's the five tribes, as we find out in, in stanza 12. This is stanza 9. In stanza, stanza 12, the five tribes are mentioned. She has made us all go beyond Ati, Drisha, Ati beyond enmities between us, beyond Svastri and Nya, beyond the other seven sister rivers. Ritavari, she, the goddess who follows Rita, the cosmic order. She spread us, Atan, as the sun, Surya, spreads the days. Aha. So, let's see that. Can we see that, please? So there are the five tribes in Sapta Sindhu being spread eastwards, southwards, northwards, westwards. Can we go back? One? Thank you. Baudhayana Shrauta Sutra 1844 says there were two migrations, one eastward, the Ayala, and one Western, the Amavasa. Now, the eastward we won't bother with. It's the movement eastwards 
towards the Gangetic Plain, but will bother with the westward one. The Amavasas were Gandharis, which is Gandhara, slightly northwest of Saptasindhu, Parshus, the Persians, west of Saptasindhu, and Arathas. Now, Aratha, we don't know, but there is a mountain called Ararat up in the Caucasus area, you know, northern Turkey, Armenia, between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. There is also a tribe of people who spoke a language called Urartu. So the Arathas might well be those people. Can we have the next one, please? And then the next one. And here you have the two uh, movements, the Ayava moving to the Ganges and the westward one, the Amavasa. There I show people moving towards the Tocharian and other Indo-European branches, the Persian, Iran, Parshut, and moving northwestward. Well, there is a little bit more, but I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. You mentioned that uh, Iranians and uh, possibly Europeans moved out of the Indo-Aryan area at, at a certain point of time. Yes. Now, what could be the possible reasons why they would do so, given that we had such a, a prosperous civilization running in, in the Indo-Aryan area? What could be the reasons why would they want to move out onto, a, let's say, an unexplored area? Uh, two reasons. One reason is that some wise people moved in order to spread the Aryan laws. I mentioned that. You, you remember that I mentioned that? Yes. The other reason is that some were perhaps discontent. You know, Arya does not mean a race. Arya is a particular type of person who followed the Arya way of life. Now among the, can we go back to the tribes? Yes. Among the tribes, some people did not follow the way of life of the Arya, the noble people. They moved off, they forgot some of the laws, they became an Arya. And in fact, there were internecine wars. Some Aryan tribes fought with others. So some of them moved away, even further away, exploring new areas, settling somewhere else to be away from these objectionable areas who wouldn't have them as their brothers. That's the second reason. The third reason, there are always people who like adventure. I mean, I like adventure, that's why I come to India and meet all you people, trying to civilize you trying to teach you your own history.